Sarah and I, um, when we decided to be musicians, it was sort of in our last year of high school, uh, we'd been playing music casually for friends, you know, making little demo tapes. And um, as things started to heat up and more people seemed interested in it, we were really thrilled and excited because I think both of us didn't really necessarily have uh, a passion outside of music. And although music hadn't seemed like an option for a job, um, it was the one thing that we probably focused the most energy into. So. Um, when people ask that question, even though they've been asking it literally since we started music, it was like, well, if you weren't doing music, what would you do? I still do not have a good answer for that. But I do think that at this point, uh, we've, you know, banked 14 years worth of energy into music. So I'm sure it would be something related to the music business. You know, we both have showed uh, interest in production and writing for other bands and projects. And, uh, you know, I think we have a pretty good uh, comprehensive knowledge of the industry so we could probably like get a job at a record label or a management company so I feel we're pretty employable we're very responsible we run a business uh, so something something in that area I think but I'm hoping that we just can stay in music so I do not have to come up with a backup plan I think my biggest fear is that we've never worked for anyone we've always been the bosses you know we even even at 18 years old when we first started touring you know we had to hire someone who could you know, carry the merch and sell the merch while we were on stage and drive the car sometimes. And so in a, in a strange way, we've really, um, our, our, our entire skill set is being the boss. Like we've always run the business and employed people. So whenever I think about transitioning out of, you know, a music career as a musician or a, as a band leader, I've, I, I now naturally gravitate towards jobs or roles where I would still be the boss. I don't, I just can't imagine going somewhere and being like, Okay, just point me in the direction. What do you want me to do for you? Like I just, I think I've, I'm, I'm too bossy now. Effectively bossy, you know. So it's, uh, so I always, <laughs> I'm terrified to think that I would have to like, you know, um, yeah, be work for someone. I just don't think I could do it. I'd start my own landscaping company. I think mow some lawns, you know, whatever. I definitely think that this record has a, a sonically cohesive feeling to it, and I, I, I'm not, not entirely certain that it has as much to do with the songwriting as it does to do with the production. You know, there was an emphasis on making sure that the, that the songs um, would work together, um, especially because we were working with multiple producers. Um, we, we, we definitely felt that the songs needed to feel like they thematically tied together and, you know, in terms of the instruments that we were using or the musicians that we were using, we really tried to keep, you know, as few variables as possible. So, for example, eight of the ten tracks on the record, it's the same drummer. So, even though Tegan may have a natural inclination to write songs with a certain type of arrangement or a certain type of arc, it's the same people who are processing the music and playing on them, so the dynamics feel really similar. So, um, and I do, th I do think that you know, on our last record, for example, there were a couple of like almost what I would call like rock or punk rock songs that Tegan brought to the album, and then my songs tended to sort of stray a little bit into the more weird or eclectic, almost pop, um, you know, genre. So this record, I think we were a little bit closer to both trying to write more like traditional pop songs. Um, but I'm so excited that people are feeling like this is like a really cohesive effort because we spent a lot of time making sure that it was. Mm -hmm. It would have been annoying if people had been like, so it's just all over the map. We would have been like, really shit, you know? A couple days ago in preparation for this, they were talking about games and it got us talking about all of our favorite uh, video games and computer games over the years. And like, you know, we're part of the 80s generation so like I remember our first computer when we were seven years old and it was like completely useless I mean there's absolutely nothing that you could do on it other than pretty much play very basic games and 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 but I remember the thrill like there's the absolute thrill of like Frogger like rushing home from school to play on Frogger and like the impact that Super that made. Mario was but that was the thing I mean, well, but but it, you know it was our it was like Atari crazy. and like those basic games in our childhood and so yeah. then to be prepubescence and getting like a super you know Mario game like you know getting Nintendo and Super Nintendo and the evolution of games like we were like truly a part of that generation that like went from having nothing to like having this best friend you know this entertainment system that lived in your room with you and you could get up on Saturday mornings and entertain yourself and, and it was not it was not expected it was novel it was like this truly ex exciting time so um, I feel like I have post-traumatic stress still from 
playing Super Mario, you know, you would sit next to, we had a best friend that, that we would, the three of us would play video games. And I can remember whoever had the controller when you would get, you know, when you would die in on a level in Super Mario, you would be like, oh, and you would like hit each other. Like it was just like the, the stress and trauma release. I don't remember that at all. Oh my God, we used to hit each other and it was like, we were just these dumb kids, but I still feel like I have post-traumatic stress when I see Super Mario. Like I'm just like, what level am yeah. I on? You know, it was like, definitely a huge part of our childhood. But then crazy. I remember, like, as an adult, I sort of missed... Sarah went through, like, she got a PlayStation and became really obsessed with all these games and would talk about... She can talk about what her favorite games were, but Grand I kind of... Yeah, I kind of missed all of that. Like, I used to play, like, Crazy Taxi. That was, like, my thing. <laughs> but, like, I was kind of, like, anti-video game for a long time. No television in my house, like, that sort of thing. And then about four and a half years ago, someone bought me a Wii. And I just was like, became like really obsessed, like totally like avoiding going out with people, like playing, you know, like Sean White snowboarding. That was like my big game and like got a balance board and like, you know, like basically became obsessed with, with Sean White and like look, you know, at photos of him online and just thought to myself, like I could probably get into like a sport, you know, maybe that could be my hobby. And, you know, so things really changed. And then recently I got really kind of obsessed with um, like all those like SimCity games and like, you know, things like, you know, Cityville and those kinds of things. Like just the idea like that, that video games have kind of gotten to a point now where you can actually learn and you can build things and that you can, you know, sort of seek an evolution through this like fantasy world and stuff. So yeah. Sarah just she's more into Grand Theft Auto though. She doesn't she's her fantasy world is more about money and violence. <laughs> Obviously. Obviously. Oh my goodness. Hmm. Groovy kind of love Phil Collins. <laughs> Which is weird. S Cindy Locker. Girls just want to have fun. Those would be my two choices for childhood. I was actually thinking the other day that, I mean, this is a very difficult question because we grew up in a family where music was always on. It was in the car. It was in my grandparents' house. My grandparents had a bar in their basement and they had a jukebox and it was like, it wasn't necessarily the music we were hearing at home, but we had just a strong as a f affection for Patsy Cline and, you know, Hank Williams as we did for you know, Sinead O'Connor and Kate Bush. So, it, you know, we didn't realize at the time, we're kids, you know, you don't really delineate between what is cool and kid-friendly and what is adult-friendly or grandparent-friendly. You know, we just liked it all. So, um, it's, it's, it's a really tough question, but the other day I heard someone talking about Dire Straits, Brothers in Arms, and I was like, I think that's a really profound record for us because it was at an age still where um, everything we were listening to was what our parents liked. And I remember that record was all over the radio. It was, my, my, my dad played it constantly. Um, and it's still a song that is a staple. I, I think I probably don't go, you know, I don't get into a car or get into a, you know, a, a radio friendly environment without hearing something from that record. You know, whether it's like, I want my MTV or, you know, whatever it is so far away. I feel like I hear that record all the time. So there's there's a million songs and a million records, but there's a, it shaped your childhood. Lately I've been thinking a lot about how just how um, how much Dire Straits permeated my childhood. It really did. It's, it's crazy. Actually, we talked Drugs, about so look at how she turned out. We talked about actually having Mark Knopfler um, like approaching him to play some guitar. We obviously didn't we made a pop record and we didn't end up playing a lot of guitar on this record, but I actually used him as a reference point like how cool would it be to get him to play some guitar on our record, you know? We definitely are very well known um, amongst certain industry and other bands, and even our fan culture. Like, is is it's very well known that Sarah and I are very very big on rules and structure, um, being Virgos, and that hasn't changed. And definitely from record to record, the rules increase. It seems, um, you know. Uh, rules from the past have been things like we don't have any hard liquor on the buses or backstage because I just feel like it weathers you and it just makes you grumpy so I just feel like it's fun in the when you're drinking it but not necessarily fun the next day so you're welcome to go and drink hard alcohol as long as it's not backstage because it's just <coughs> it's like we call it Christmas day like it's not groundhog day because every day is different but every day on the road is kind of like Christmas day it's a lot of socializing and um you know sort of like grazing the like food table and then finally at the end of the day there's something to look forward to so um, but on this on this record, we actually the, the I think the thing that's really significant to point out is we've actually taken away a lot of rules. So a lot of the structure that we've had in place has sort of stopped. It feels like we've gotten to an age maybe where we all are much more responsible. There's a lot more um, 
there's a lot more maturity out there on the road. You know, there's no need to tell people like you need to be in bed by a reasonable hour, or you can't be coming on and off the bus. And well, that's probably you know. indicative of the age group that Ex we've now started hiring yeah, so, to work with us. So it's like less rules. So like things are finally we've hit a point. We've hit that tipping point, and now we're now we're heading into territory where it's like, well, maybe we don't need to laminate the rules and make everyone carry them around with them. So <laughs> a little more flexibility out there. It's really funny because I feel like gaming culture, um, what's really popular and significant um, are games that we're ne not necessarily drawn to, which I know is a bit of a stereotype and you know, whatever, but like, I don't play any war games. I don't play any games where I'm like blowing people's heads off or like doing anything like that. So it's like, it's not as, um, like, I, know, I don't know that we're as up to date on like the characters that people really like these days. But I do have a funny story. I, I, I had never played Portal before. I had never, I didn't, ha I didn't understand that game at all. But um, I ended up singing the theme. I did like the 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 guy that wrote the song, the theme song for Portal. He asked me if I would do like a human version of the of the song and sing it actually and do it. And in learning about that game, I thought that that character, like that she is amazing, like this kind of sociopathic, like sort of like. Like, and I was like, I like can totally get behind this lady. Like, you know, like I just Resonated thought that, with yeah, like it was such a funny character because I think for us, like we associate a lot of gaming characters and people with our childhood, as we were saying before. So it's like the cartoonish kind of like Super Mario and the princess and the toad and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I think that was my first introduction into like some of the grown up characters and how like absolutely, um, there's a ton of depth to these people. They, their their whole worlds are figured out, and their whole background and their character studies and everything. So that was like my first introduction, and I don't know what it it's says about me slope. that I was drawn into a sociopathic, uh, killing, murdering robot, you know, type woman. I don't know what that says about me. It might be me. It could be the people I like. I don't know. It doesn't. I don't know. You know, I think going back to sort of talking about the music that really shaped our childhood, I think there were like massive, massive influences that have shaped us, you know, as, as grown up, you know, adult artists and, you know, everything from David Bowie to Cyndi Lauper, like those characters, because they truly were characters. I mean, you know, back then it was not good enough just to put out music, you know, people really had a very, very like 3D image and I think that like David Bowie, I just remember having a profound effect on us because he was in Labyrinth, right? So this movie that was aimed at children and he had this like very strange but very like like fun music. So although we didn't understand the themes as children, you know, it was what our parents loved, our dad loved, you know, David Bowie and, and Ziggy Sardust. And so we were like dancing around at the in the house listening to him and associating like childhood love and, and affection with him and then and then he was this like crazy, like, you know, incredibly hard to understand, you know, as a child character in Labyrinth, our favorite movie. And so I think about that and I just I feel like that like, you know, really impacted me. And I feel like, you know, as as a, as an artist now looking back on someone like David Bowie, I mean it's still Did so, you write a song that you wish So you'd profound written? everything. Well this is like Labyrinth. I mean like this the movie, every song on that I mean I just watched it recently in a park with my dad outdoors as an adult and I knew every word. I mean I was just like, Oh my god, like my dad and I all wrapped up in blankets watching this movie singing along. So I went and found the soundtrack on vinyl and you know, I just wish that I could be David Bowie from that era.